Next on PIJN News, Dr. Chaps reports on these important issues. April 15th is the American tax deadline to file your income tax reports. Today we have an exclusive interview with author and historian Bill Federer, a book on the history of the income tax. Former Navy Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt took a stand to defend religious freedom by daring to pray publicly in Jesus' name. Now he helps you by reporting the news, discerning the spirits, and praying the scriptures. Would you pray with us? Here's Dr. Chaps. God bless you in Jesus' name. My name is Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt, Dr. Chaps, and you're watching PIJN News. On today's show, we have a live, exciting interview that I recorded with Bill Federer when I was at NRB. He wrote a book on the history of the income tax. But first, the news. Today is April 15th, income tax filing deadline day. And according to WEAU of Wisconsin, they say that this is the day to file your income taxes. The Department of Revenue, that is in most states, will recommend that taxpayers not wait until the last minute to file. But if you haven't filed, and by the way, this is the last minute, returns must be received or at least postmarked by midnight tonight, April 15th. Department of Revenue Secretary Peter Barca notes the following, quote, we process around 3 million returns annually in his particular state. Around a half million returns came in the last two weeks. Our season total is just under 2 million, so activity is really picking up. You must file an extension request with the IRS if you didn't make or don't plan to make the April 15th deadline. And the IRS also will allow you to avoid late filing penalties if you file that extension. You can even do that on the website, irs.gov, and search for the word extension for more information. And taxpayers who do file an extension request automatically receive that extension from their own state as well as from the federal government. You must keep a copy of your IRS federal extension application, 4868, that's the form number, for your records. And keep in mind that even if you have an extension of time to file your return, you may owe interest on any tax not prepaid by or before April 15th. You can avoid interest charges by adding a little bit of money. If you mail in a little bit of money, even if it's not an exact amount to the IRS, you can avoid paying interest on debt that might be owed later. In 2019, the income tax limits for all tax brackets and filers are adjusted according to inflation. For example, the top marginal rate, I think we might have a chart here, is about 37% for high income earners who make more than a half million dollars a year. And even higher, that's if you're married filing jointly, higher for single filers who earn $600,000 a year. You know, I don't have that problem, (laughs) to be honest. And that's the news. Our thanks to WEAU Wisconsin for that amazing report. Um, You know, it's important that you pay your taxes. And why do we do that? Because we're not thieves and we do pay our debts. And even Jesus encouraged that, right? In Matthew 22, Jesus discouraged cheating on your taxes. Here's what he said. Uh, They asked him, whose coin is this? He said, Caesar's. And then he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God's. Amen? Let's pray about this, would you pray with me? Father, we pray that all those watching will be honest and pay their taxes to Caesar, the government, but even more importantly, Father, that we will devote our riches and our wealth to God, that we will give to God what is God's, that we will tithe to our local church, that we will support Christian charities. Uh, And Father, I pray that the finances come into this ministry to help us broadcast the gospel in Jesus name, amen. Let's take a short break. When we come back, we're gonna have Bill Federer, Christian historian, wrote a book on the history of the income tax. It's more exciting than you might think. This is PIJN News, defending your religious freedom. Dr. Chaps will be right back. Reading today's headlines, doesn't it seem sometimes like the world is unreal? We hear about rumors of wars and we see legislative and cultural battles here in America, but where is our hope? I think it's in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're offering now a a DVD series led by family ministry leader, Vince Dacchioli, Real Christianity. 
in an unreal world. It behooves us to really understand what does it mean to be relevant as a Christian and to be real and to spread the gospel in a way to where more and more people will, be in, will embrace it and move yeah. in the right direction. We can send you the entire DVD series, which is three-part teaching with Vince and a bonus of my personal testimony for a suggested donation of just $30 if you call now at 866-Obey-God. Or write to the address on your screen or visit PrayInJesusName.org. We want to rush you this important teaching to ground your faith in real Christianity. Did you know religious freedom is under fire in our military today? Our troops do not have protection. For example, military chapels are now being desecrated by homosexual wedding ceremonies on bases in all 50 states. Our troops are now also face punishment if they dare to object to sharing common sleeping quarters or common shower facilities, or if chaplains dare to quote the Bible during private counseling that declares that homosexuality is a sin. Nobody in our military should be forced to violate their Christian conscience, especially their right to pray publicly in Jesus' name. Let's take action today for religious freedom. Would you sign a petition with me? Visit PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org. Let's defend religious freedom for our troops. Take action today. Dr. Chaps needs you to sign today's petition right now. Again, visit PrayInJesusName.org to sign our petition right now. Defending your religious freedom, here is Dr. Chaps. Welcome back, I'm Dr. Chaps, joined now by Bill Federer, Christian historian and author of this new book, The Interesting History of the Income Tax. Uh, Bill, thanks for coming on the program. Chaps, great to be with you. So was the alternate title, The Boring History of the Income Tax, <laughs> that, that copy did not sell very well, did it? Uh, well, this c covers it, and it is interesting. Good. And uh, just to jump right in, uh, there was no income tax in America prior to the Civil War. The federal government was financed through excise taxes on specific items like salt, tea, tobacco, and the tariff taxes on imports from other countries. And the problem uh, was that the taxes that helped the North hurt the South. So the tariff taxes made imports more expensive and so the southern states that really didn't have factories, they had to either buy more expensive stuff from Europe because of these tariffs or the stuff from the more expensive northern factories. And so the tariffs were actually funding it. And so prior to the Civil War, at one point, 90% of the federal government was financed by tariff taxes collected from southern ports like Charleston, South Carolina. And so that was the underlying financial uh, instigation of the Civil War. Well, a lot of people say, no, it was only about slavery, but you're right, there were economic factors. Right, so it wasn't until the Emancipation Proclamation that Lincoln gained the moral high ground and switched the purpose of the war from the South wanting to be free from a uh, large federal government to slavery. And it was a brilliant move on Lincoln's part. Why? Because England had just gone through William Wilberforce and John Newton and getting rid of slavery. And uh, when uh, it was John Adams' grandson that was the U.S. ambassador to England, and he talked them out of supporting the Confederacy once Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And that happened, the economy of the South dried up. So it was a brilliant move on Lincoln's part, but back to the taxes. So after the Civil War, uh, the South really had no voice, and so the North passed all kinds of tariff taxes, lots and lots of them, and they worked. And this protection from European imports allowed the northern factories to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it did have the good effect of raising the standard of living in America, the fastest and the highest of any nation in world history. And we're having steel and railroads and bridges and uh, washing machines and these things that are, you know, pipes and they're freeing women up from having to go to the well and having to, you know, weave clothes and everything. Now they can have uh, machines and factories make all this stuff. And so, it's and what sparked that industrial revolution, so to speak? Um, the uh, factories in the north uh, learned how to put a uh, water mill together, which turned uh, machinery and they could have the weaving and all the, the manufacturing base. So just technology, but they didn't get rid of the federal government. No, uh, so, the, um, so Lincoln, during the Civil War, passed an emergency income tax. It was called the Revenue Act. 
and he raised $750 million to finance the North during the Civil War. Uh, he also issued greenbacks. So prior to the Civil War, states had their own currency. Afterwards, the federal government had the currency. Uh, it was just paper, though, and then they discovered gold in the Rockies that they were able to pay it off, pay off the debt. But um, so after the Civil War, you now have the first income tax. But it was repealed in 1873 because the war's over. There's no emergency. So there was no income tax in America again until 1892. And this is when you had these industrialists that had these factories and they became wealthy. And there was this Marxist movement in Germany that began to come across. And there was this movement to want to take away the money from the rich. And uh, it almost passed, but the Supreme Court, in the case of Pollock versus Farmers Loan and Trust, declared income tax unconstitutional. It says any tax that discriminates based on race, religion, or economic class status is class legislation and leads to abuses. So no income tax again in America. And Until the Supreme Wilson. Court said basically that rich people are a protected class, that because if you have an income tax, it's not fair to the rich. Right, so the redistribution of wealth is a socialist concept. Uh, every man according to his ability to every man according to his need. Uh, sounds good on paper. The problem is uh, it's run by people that want to stay in power. And so they're going to always take away money from their political opponents and funnel it to their political supporters. Yeah. That's the problem with, with any um, social program. Um, a little side note, uh, the church took care of the immigrants. The church took care of the health care. The church took care of the, the orphanages, the medical clinics, and the schools. And, and, and so God gives commands to five groups, individuals, uh, families, employer employees, church, and government. The individuals are commanded to be generous. Give to the poor, right? And uh, you know, turn the other cheek. If they take your coat, give them your shirt. There's no command for the family to be generous. The commands to the family are husbands love your wives, children submit to your parents, that type of thing. The commands to the employer is to, you know, pay an honest day's wage and to the worker to, you know, give an honest day's work. The command to the church, the church is commanded to be generous. And they have orphanages and medical clinics and feeding the widows and everything. There's no command for the government to be generous. The command to the government is the simplest, protect the innocent, punish the guilty. Wow. What's happened is, is that the church neglect, neglected to do the, uh, taking care of the poor, and the government usurped it. And so again, the problem is whenever you have the government running a program, it's run by people who want to keep their jobs. And the temptation is to use their position to perpetuate their job and take away uh, money and funds from those that challenge them and to funnel it to those that can support them. So uh, anyway, so back to the, there's no income tax in America till the Civil War, an emergency one Lincoln pushed. After the Civil War, it's repealed, 1892, they try to have a peacetime income tax declared unconstitutional. Finally, Woodrow Wilson pushes through the income tax, the 16th Amendment in 1913. It's a 1% tax on the top 1% richest people in the country. It's not to tax the people, it's to go after those robber barons. Yeah. The Rockefellers, Carnegie's, J. Paul Getty's, the Astors. It would be sort of like today that only Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and George Soros, that's what the tax is for. And only 1% of the 1%. Right, and so the, um, and, you know, John D. Rockefeller was the richest man in the world. Um, you know, he would uh, uh, do a deal with the railroads to ship his standard oil cheaper than his competitors. He would sell it cheaper, put his competitors out of business. He would have a monopoly. He'd raise the price of oil through the roof, and then he'd give the railroads a kickback. And he did this over and over and over again until he put all his competitors out of business, became the richest man in the world. And so the people in the country were like, we need to tax these robber barons. And so you had um, Taft. Uh, pushing through a um, uh, inheritance uh, or a, a corporate income tax. And only the extreme wealthy owned corporate stock. So it was a backdoor way to get at them. Teddy Roosevelt uh, was responsible for the um, uh, inheritance tax because only the extreme wealthy had an inheritance worth leaving. But finally, Woodrow Wilson pushes through the income tax, which is the 1% tax on the top 1% richest people. We're going to take a short break right there, but. Listen, I'm fascinated. It is interesting. And the book is The Interesting History of the Income Tax. William J. Federer is our Christian historian. We'll be back right after this. Giving you a megaphone in Washington, D.C. Dr. Chaps will be right back. I'm Dr. Chaps. You know, some people are worried that we're losing our country, but they ask, how can we take a stand? 
we have produced now these two effective resources for you, a DVD video series and a book. Yours for a suggested donation of just $50, and we will offer you four videos on this disc to teach you how to become an effective Christian activist. For example, how did I send five million petitions to Congress? How did we organize and change bad laws or policies in 13 states? How did I run and win a seat in the Colorado legislature? We will also offer you this 30-day prayer manual, How to Liberate the World in 30 Days. They're both yours for a suggested donation of just $50. Visit our website, PrayInJesusName.org, or write to the address on your screen, or better yet, pick up the phone and call us at 866-O-B-E-Y-G-O-D. You can learn the easy steps to take back your country. Call us today. We're here in Israel, in literally the scene of all of the holy sites, like the Via Dolorosa, where Jesus carried his cross, the garden tomb where he was raised from the dead, the Sea of Galilee, where he taught the disciples. And I prayed, Lord, how can I bring this inspiring environment into your living room? And what we've produced is a four DVD disc set with the entire Gospel of Matthew. I teach every verse in all 28 chapters of Matthew in short 12 minute segments, so you can understand the exact words that Jesus taught from the exact location where Jesus lived. Pick up the phone right now and call us at 866-Obey-God. Again, that's 866-O-B-E-Y-G-O-D. For a suggested donation of just $50, we'll give you all four discs, the entire Gospel of Matthew, or you can write to us at the address on your screen or visit our website, PrayInJesusName.org. You're gonna love this Bible teaching. Pick up the phone and call us today. Welcome back, I'm Dr. Chaps, joined again by the most interesting man in the world. No, no, that's a, a Cerveza commercial, hang on. This is uh, the interesting history of the income tax, William J. Federer. So 1913, uh, Wilson creates the income tax. How did that fundamentally change the, uh, the economics of, of the way that people uh, do business? People say, well, did the 16th Amendment pass legally? Was it ratified by the states? The problem is the countries wanted it. Why? Because it wasn't going to tax them. It was just to go after the Rockefellers and Carnegie's, J. Paul Getty's and so forth. Well, then World War I starts. And we have a track record of an emergency income tax during a war called the Civil War. And America says, OK, we got World War I. It's an emergency. We'll swallow another. And so the country gets taxed. But after the war, the income tax is reduced basically again to the, just the elites, just the extreme wealthy. World War II and FDR expands the income tax greater than it had ever been in history, so the majority of the country pays it. This begins outsourcing. You think outsourcing, what's that? So after World War II, America helps rebuild Germany and Japan with brand new equipment and they can produce stuff cheaper than our old pre-World War II clunky machines, and they end up getting a larger percentage of the global market. And so uh, John F. Kennedy comes along, and he says it's of the utmost urgency that we cut taxes on businesses so that they can afford to get the brand new equipment so that our workers can have the best stuff so we can compete with our former enemies that we've built brand new equipment with. And uh, John uh, F. Kennedy said that if we give people a tax cut, they will spend their money, the employers, the factories will have to hire more workers to meet the new demand for these products, and so uh, it'll be a win-win. A lot of people view today, uh, looking retroactively at JFK's policy, and say he's more like a Republican than he would be a Democrat. FDR was the big, big government Democrat but JFK actually wanted to cut taxes. Right, here's a quote from John F. Kennedy. Every dollar released from taxation that is spent or invested will help create a new job and a new salary. And those new jobs and new salaries can create other jobs and other salaries for an expanding American economy. So his idea was cut taxes so businesses will have more money to invest and get better equipment, we can compete better globally, and cut taxes on the people, they'll have more money and spend it, and the factories will have to hire more workers and will create lower the unemployment. If I were to do that today, I would say, cut taxes on businesses that keep their jobs in America. Yeah. Now what happened? You had uh, FDR, we still have the residual effect, uh, and, and John F. Kennedy talks about it. 
He says that uh, our tax plan causes an undue stimulation and flow of finances from America to other countries to avoid the taxes. He's talking about FDR, raise the, squeeze the sponge, the water goes out. You make it more expensive to do business in America, and guess what? The businessmen and women are gonna move their businesses to other countries. It's as simple as this. You're driving down the street, and you need gas, and it's $5 a gallon on this side of the street, and it's $2 a gallon on the other side of the street. Question, are you gonna cross, do a left turn, and get into the other lane to take the $2 a gallon gas? If you're willing to do that, you cannot criticize businesses for going overseas and moving their business over there. They're in the business to be in business. Yeah. And so what happened was, once we rate FDR's taxes get raised, the businesses move overseas, they lobby Congress to lower the tariffs so they can bring their stuff in cheaper, and they gain the competitive advantage over those guys that are still here in America. And you do this for 50 years, and you move all of our manufacturing base out, and China and India and every place ends up becoming uh, more profitable, and we lose jobs. So last question, we're gonna end this segment, but uh, fast forward to the 1980s. My observation, and I just studied this a little bit, uh, was that Ronald Reagan ran on a pledge to lower the income tax. He did that on the top marginal rate, went from 70% down to 50% in 1981, uh, and then down to 38.5% in 1986, uh, and then down to 28% in 1989, and then George Bush, George H.W. Bush, got in trouble with his no new taxes pledge, but he broke that. He raised it from 28% up to 31%. Um, what's the right amount? Because we all want the faster, better, cheaper economy um, and we, we're familiar with the Laffer curve, which says if you tax too much, everyone goes broke. If you tax too little, the government goes broke. So is there a happy medium in there? Historically, a fifth is what people willingly will pay. That goes all the way back to Joseph in Egypt. And the people will, uh, you know, grow their corn uh, and they give, you know, wheat, whatever the grain was, and they would give a fifth of it. And so during the feudal eras in Europe, where you would have the serfs work in the land, they would give a fifth of it to their, their local king. And so if the taxes get more than a fifth, 20%, uh, people find look for ways to get around it. Yeah. And so you don't mind spending stuff to have nice roads, uh, nice, you know, uh, secure neighborhoods. But again, once it gets more than that, uh, people want to find a way around it. Another interesting thing, FDR embraced John Maynard Keynes. He's an economist, yeah. and he came up with a debt-stimulated economy. What's that? You have the government spend money in the private sector to create jobs. Those jobs pay taxes, and the taxes pay off the debt. Right? The government goes in debt to, to pay money in the private sector to create jobs. Jobs pay taxes, and the taxes pay off the debt. It looks really nice on a chalkboard. <laughs> the problem is it's run by politicians that want to get reelected. And it runs up the national debt. Right, and so each generation of politicians say, hmm, if I go in debt, spend money in my district, I'll get more votes and I'll get reelected. So let's let the next set of congressmen worry about the debt, and I'm going to keep increasing it. This was actually a study done by James Buchanan. Now, not Pat Buchanan, but James Buchanan. 1980, he wins the um, Nobel Prize in Economics. And he discovered what makes politicians tick. He found out that, okay, he's an economist, and he's studying what's the biggest thing on the economy, the national debt. And he's like, why, where does it come from? It comes from these politicians voting it in. He goes, what goes into the decision-making process of these politicians? He finds out that if the politicians are up for re-election, they will vote for more debt to spend money in their districts to help them get re-elected, but they will not vote for the necessary corresponding tax increase to pay for it, because that'll hurt the re-election chances. Wow. Wow. So he, he gets the Nobel Prize because he finds out that politicians want to get re-elected. <laughs> Anything, <laughs> but as a result. This is terrible. <laughs> That's why I'm a low tax Republican, everybody. In fact, a, to the right of the GOP, I'm a Tea Party debt slasher when I happen to be in. B Bill Federer, I love what you're doing. We're going to have you on again tomorrow, but hold up your book and talk about this. So it's the interesting, in interesting history of income tax. Uh, I go through uh, all the, you know, um, stories of our country's history where there's uh, the... Uh, all of the social programs are run by churches 
Yep. That's why they didn't pay any taxes because the church took care of all the welfare. Uh, I studied the history of hospitals. Almost all the hospitals are started by churches. Baptist, Catholic, uh, the, the nuns, the uh, different orders. The, the nurse's hat came from the nun's hat. What's your website? Uh, it's AmericanMinute.com. And, and the church also produced moral populace, so neighborhoods were safer, so you didn't have to spend money for the government for all the welfare programs and all the uh, d fire departments and police departments because people were more responsible because the church raised a moral populace. Great information in the book, uh, The Interesting History of Income Tax, and AmericanMinute.com is the website. AmericanMinute.com, get the book today. We'll see you on the next program. Dr. Chaps will be right back with more PIJN News. If you've watched our program, you know that we stand with Israel as God's chosen people. We need you to sign a petition today. Why? Because did you know that even as Iran is now developing 800 mile range cruise missiles, could be nuclear tip very soon, that our US Congress has now three brand new freshman congresswomen we call them the three anti-Semitic musketeers, Ocasio-Cortez and two Muslims, Talib and Omar. And they are influencing Nancy Pelosi to have the most anti-Semitic Congress in years. We need to stand with our friends in Israel and that's why we're asking you to sign a petition. Visit PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org. Don't divide Jerusalem, stand with Israel and stand up to the United Nations. We will fax it to the Congress, but you need to sign today. Take a stand. Visit PrayInJesusName.org and sign our petition today. He is the intersection of church and state. Here is Dr. Chaps. Our website is PrayInJesusName.org. Again, PrayInJesusName.org. Please sign a petition, sign up for our free email alerts, or donate. We need your donations to bring you these informative programs. If you need prayer, call us at 866-Obey-God. We'll see you next time. You know, people ask me, Chaps, we're watching on this network. We've already set our DVR to record your shows, but our friends don't have this network or maybe they can't watch at this time. Did you know we are on demand on 10 different platforms? You can tell your friends to find this show, PIJN News, on their Roku box or their Amazon Fire box. Just look under the religion or news categories. Or maybe you have a smartphone or your friends or grandchildren can find us on Android TV, Google TV, Smart TV, or iTunes. Of course, we're always on the internet. Look for us on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, or better yet, subscribe to our daily email alerts at PrayInJesusName.org. It's important that you share all of these available platforms with your friends so we can mobilize all of the body of Christ to pray the news and change the world. Would you join us? Visit PrayInJesusName.org to learn more. Dr. Chaps needs your financial support to stay on the air. Would you please send your best donation today? Please visit PrayInJesusName.org to donate online. Or you can mail a check to Pray In Jesus Name Ministries, Post Office Box 77077, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80970. You can also call us toll free right now at 866-Obey-God. That's 866-O-B-E-Y-G-O-D. Please sign up for our free emails at PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org.